Hi class, welcome to Advantage. My name is Dr. Scott Adamson, and in this video, we're gonna continue to explore the idea of accumulating area under a curve. Now in previous videos, uh, we explored how to do that using a left-hand sum and a right-hand sum, but in this video, we're gonna look at this thing called the definite integral a little bit more carefully. Now in this context, the graph that we're examining here is this hypothetical graph of a subway train. This is the velocity of the train in feet per second, and this is an elapsed time, a total of 20 seconds we're gonna look at. Now imagine that we're at the train stop and we see the train coming, and we're gonna start keeping track of things then. So at time zero is when we're gonna start keeping track of the train's velocity. Notice that the train's velocity is 15 feet per second. That train is traveling at a constant speed of 15 feet per second for five seconds. Then the train's velocity steadily decreases to zero. Then the train's velocity actually goes into the negative quantities here. Now what that means is the train has changed directions. We're gonna say that the um, positive velocity is when the train is coming towards us and the negative velocity is when the train is going away from us. Now this is a very simplified model, but the idea is constant velocity, steadily decreasing velocity to a velocity of zero, the train stopped for an instant, negative velocity, increasingly negative as the train moves back away from us, and then constant velocity once again, uh, 15 feet per second moving away from us. So what we'd like to explore first is this. In this chart, let's figure out the train's position in feet in each of these five second increments. Now this is the train's position, starting at when we first notice it. We're gonna say the train's position initially is zero. Where it is right now, zero. Then, what happens? Where is this train after it's been traveling for five seconds? Well, this train has been traveling 15 feet per second for five seconds. So we're gonna think about the area of this rectangle. If a train travels 15 feet per second for five seconds, this area is a visual geometric representation of the distance that that train has traveled. 15 feet per second is like the height of the rectangle. Five seconds is the base of the rectangle, so the base times the height, the area of this rectangle is just a representation of the total distance traveled. 15 feet per second for five seconds. 15 times five is 75. We would say that in that first five seconds, the train has traveled 75 feet. Now, after that, the train's speed is steadily decreasing. And so now, instead of the area as if it had a constant speed that whole time, a constant velocity, the velocity is ever changing. And so the area that we're examining now for this next five seconds is the area of that triangle. Now the area of this triangle is the area of the rectangle, half of it. Now the area of the rectangle would be as if it was 15 feet per second for five seconds, that same 75 feet we saw before, but because it's the area of a triangle to represent this distance, it's gonna be half of 75, 37.5. So the area here, remember, was 75 feet. The area here is 37.5 feet. So all together in that first 10 seconds, that train will travel a total of 112.5 feet. Now, again, in this simplified model, the train stops for an instant and then travels in the opposite direction. So for the next five seconds, we're gonna see a distance as represented by this area once again. The area underneath that curve, for the next five seconds, the train's velocity is steadily increasing back to that 15. Now, if it just stayed 15 the entire time, we'd have an area here that's just like that first rectangle, 15 feet per second for five seconds would be a total area of 75. Now we say in mathematics that that area would be a negative, not to say that it's a weird thing, it just means that the, tr the train traveled the opposite direction. So negative 75 just means the opposite direction. But again, it's only a triangle, it's not a whole rectangle, so half of that 
So we would say that the area here is negative 37.5. So traveled 112 feet towards the station, stopped, and then traveled 37.5 feet away from the station. So we're back to 75 feet from its original position. And then for this last five seconds, from 15 to 20 seconds, now we're, this train is at full speed again at 15 feet per second in the opposite direction. And so the area of this rectangle is a visual geometric representation of the distance traveled. So again, we have a 15 feet per second for five seconds. We have 75 feet, but since it's a negative velocity, it's a negative 75 feet, just meaning it moved back the other direction, 75 feet. So if it was at 75 feet, went back 75 feet, it's now back to its original position that we observed it when we first started measuring this train's position. So the area underneath this curve, positive area means the train's coming towards the station 112.5 feet. Negative area meaning the train moved back away from the station 112.5 feet to get back to its original starting position. Now, we know that we can express these areas using the idea of the integral because what we're doing is we're summing up velocity in feet per second times delta, time, delta t, delta time, change in time measured in seconds. So that product is gonna measure feet and if we accumulate how much feet has um, been traveled during each of those time intervals, zero to five, zero to 10, 10 to 20, zero to 20, et cetera, we can express that distance as the integral of velocity. So let's see. This symbolically just says sum up, find the area, sum up the area underneath that velocity curve between zero and five. We know that that area is 75 feet. This one says, sum up the area underneath that velocity curve between zero and 10. Between zero and 10, we had a total of 75 plus 37.5, we had a total of 112.5 feet. Between 10 and 20, between 10 and 20, we had uh, a total of negative 37.5 plus the negative 75. If we just total up between 10 and 20, that total is gonna be negative 112.5. And again, don't be alarmed that we're calling this negative. All we're saying is that the train traveled the opposite direction, 112.5 feet. And then if we go all the way from 0 to 20, 0 to 20, sum up all of those areas, accumulate all those areas, 75 plus 37.5, 112.5, minus 37.5, minus 75, minus 112.5, that total is going to be 0 feet. Again, meaning the train is just back to its original position from when we started watching this. So we've been able to determine the position of the train given the velocity graph of this train. Remember, a positive velocity meant the train was traveling toward the station, towards us. A negative velocity meant the train was traveling away from us. A positive distance or position meant the train was coming towards us. A negative distance in feet meant the train was traveling away from us. So the area underneath that velocity curve helped us to figure out those distances. But now I want to build your intuition about another very important mathematical idea. And we're going to do that by looking at the change in the position of the train. So we're going to go back to our table over here and examine some particular cases. Let's start with this. What was the position of the train after five seconds? And let's compare that to the position of the train initially at time t equals zero seconds. Now, when I say compare, I'm just saying look at the positions at each of those times and see how much difference there is between them. So the position of the train after five seconds was 75 feet. The position of the train initially was zero feet. And so, of course, that meant the train changed its position by a total of 75 feet. Let's look at another case. Let's examine the position of the train at 10 seconds and compare that to the position of the train initially at zero seconds. From our previous work, we know that the position of the train at 10 seconds was 112.5 feet. And initially, the train's position was zero feet. 
And so we, uh, we have a total change there of 112.5 feet. Now you might see where I'm going with this, but hang with me, let's just do two more. Let's compare the position of the train at 20 seconds to the position of the train at 10 seconds. Now from our table, we see that at 20 seconds, the position of the train was zero. That, had, that means it went back to its original spot when we first started tracking this train. And its position after 10 seconds was 112.5. And so we have this uh, computationally, zero minus 112.5 is negative 112.5 feet which means the train traveled away from us 112.5 feet. Let's just do one more. Let's look at the position of the train at 20 seconds. Let's look at the position of the train at zero seconds and compare those two positions. The position of the train at 20 seconds, zero. It was back to its starting spot. The position of the train at zero seconds was zero feet because it was at its original starting spot. And so there is no difference between those. We would say the change in position is zero feet. So the idea that I want you to see here maybe clearly is notice how the integral of the velocity between zero and five matches up with the change in position from zero to five. Likewise, the integral from zero to 10 matches up with the change in position between zero and 10 seconds. 10 and 20 seconds, zero and 20 seconds. There seems to be something uh, interesting going on here. So something really interesting is going on here. I hope you can appreciate what's happening here. What's happening here is that the integral of velocity and the change in position over the common intervals produce the same quantity. We call this the total change principle. That is, the integral of the velocity can be found by looking at the total change in position. Now, the important relationship to notice here is the relationship between this function s, the position of the train in our context, and this function v, the velocity of the train in our context. The integral of velocity can be found by examining the change in position. So note, the derivative of s would produce v. The derivative of position would produce velocity. So what we say is when we know a velocity function and we want to compute a position function, rather than calling this the derivative, we'll call this the antiderivative. Now more generally, this, this doesn't only work in velocity and position situations. This can work with any kind of a rate of change situation. So if you have any rate of change, maybe it's a velocity, maybe it's the rate at which snowfall falls in inches per hour, it could be any context. If we know something about the velocity or the rate of change, and we wanna accumulate all of that area to, uh, to find out distance or to find out amount of snowfall, we just need to find the function, the position function, or the function that makes that derivative function and evaluate that function at its endpoints, f of b minus f of a, the total change principle. In other words, the integral of a rate of change gives the total change in that quantity. Now this is often referred to as the fundamental theorem of calculus. And it's fundamental because of a couple of big reasons. Reason number one, it helps us to find the precise exact area underneath a curve by summing up infinitely many infinitesimally thin areas of rectangles. But it also mathematically gives us a beautiful relationship between a function and its a derivative, and its derivative. In fact, the integral of a derivative produces this function, produces this antiderivative. That is, we would call the function f the antiderivative function. So, in future videos, we're gonna explore this even more to see how can we apply the fundamental theorem of calculus to help us to find area underneath a curve for specific contexts.